So um, Kron took, uh, he, uh, he went fully, took advantage of all kinds of resources here at Prairie State. It's worked out really well for him. As you guys know, the focus of this workshop is his admissions into Stanford, and we have been systematically breaking down actions he took on campus, thing, work that he did, things also be, that are unrelated to campus that are unique to Kron, um, to just kind of lay it out there so you can learn from that and adapt that. And we want to, you know, we have takeaway points and things so that that can be adapted to uh, what is right for you. Um, so, let's see. It's our first time presenting together, Kron and myself. Um, I like starting out, oh, we do, we welcome questions. We prepared about 40 minutes of information. We have an hour, we, we don't, they're not gonna kick us out after an hour, so ask questions along the way, ask at the end, whatever feels right for you, okay? Um, I like to kick off with this, uh, Kron shared, he, he let me read some of the essays and everything we were talking about, he said is okay to share, and he is here yes. <laughs> to, okay to share. Um, he let me read his essays so I could get insight into that to continue to help people. So just as a context for you guys, I am a counselor here, but I have a specialty in helping students go on for their bachelor's degree after Prairie State. I've been in this role for 12 years. I've been in higher education for more than 20 years. I worked at four-year private and public four-year universities before I came to Prairie State. Um, so I've been doing this particular role for, you know, for a while in higher ed in general. I love higher ed. So I love making it affordable. The reason we're focusing on Stanford is because they did offer him full funding. So do you want to describe what that, that is? Um, so typically with schools like um, Stanford and you know all the highly selective schools that I applied to, um, if you're under a certain income bracket, they'll fund your tuition. And if you're under a slightly lower, they'll fund room and board also. Um, so that was one of the main reasons I applied to those private schools because they are typically more generous with financial aid. Um, so if, as long as you can get in, uh, you don't, they don't want anybody to not go there because they can't afford it. And um, you know, a lot of people don't know about that. So uh, I thought that was a good um, reason to at least shoot my shot. <laughs> yeah, and always have a backup plan too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> which, which he did. Uh, and we'll talk about that more. I do want to mention I have one handout in the back that you could grab at, that's titled University Transfer Scholarships or Free Tuition Programs for Community College Graduates. It's a, just a selected list. It is not exhaustive, but just give you an idea. And there is a point where I talk about highly selective universities because that's a focus we have now. Things we're talking about in today's workshop is focused if you're heading if you if you want to shoot for a highly selective university or really competitive scholarships doing this sort of thing as well if you're planning to go on to grad school these are all things to be doing as well finding the, the version that's right for you and right for your path of course we'll be focusing things on on Quran's particular thing but it's adaptable to other majors schools career career path so that handout will be helpful I actually mentioned some of the schools that have these. They usually call them loan-free promises, highly selective universities. If you're under 24 and your family's income is under a certain amount, that if you get in, they're making a promise that you will not have to take out loans to graduate with them, okay? It is super, this would be a good time for us to talk about um, that it is super hard to get into the highly selective universities. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm jumping ahead. I do this, I kind of move around. <laughs> Kron says he's okay with that, but this, I just love this quote. This was from one of his essays um, when he let me read his essays to gra gather insight to help future students. I asked him if I could copy and keep one line and that was the line. <laughs> and apparently Stanford, when they sent their, the physical acceptance letter, and um, do you want to tell them? Yeah, so they, um, they, they wrote a handwritten note on the physical acceptance letter and it just, they also used this quote which stood out to Sarah as well. So. <laughs> I thought that was interesting that um, they seemed to like this perspective and then they said um, just we hope that you know you'll have opportunities to uh, step outside your comfort zone at our institution so I thought that was really nice. Um, this essay in particular I was talking about um, speech team uh, which is something that 
really helped me grow as a person. Uh, I was stepping outside of my comfort zone because I hate public speaking, oddly enough. So uh, <laughs> I, um, yeah, I just made that commitment to try to um, run towards places that scared me. So, yeah. All right. So just so you guys can know the, the kind of success, we are focusing on Stanford because they gave him the full funding award, tuition, housing, insurance, you know, like whatever. He actually went to, uh, I think we counted 14 schools. Several of them accepted him without funding. Um, Princeton waitlisted. Princeton's kind of a unique one in that this, they had not been taking transfer students from any two or four year school for a long time. This is their first year to do it again. They, according to the most recent um, information that I read on their website, they accepted, thir they, one said 12, the mo more recent one says 13. They accepted 13 students and waitlisted 20. And Cron was waitlisted, <laughs> so still pretty impressive. Um, Decline. There's some in the past, yeah. And um, when he's still waiting to hear from, that's one thing for highly selective universities. You usually hear a lot later, so be prepared to not hear till May or even June, mm -hmm. if you're getting in or not. Um, now you applied to some of these schools last year. Yes. So I applied to six schools, a few that aren't on this list, but they were all highly selective last year, and uh, I got rejected from all six. Uh, I, I was applying as a sophomore, so I didn't have my associates yet. Maybe that had something to do with it, but I learned a lot from the process of applying and getting rejected. Um, so although it could seem like a failure, I don't think, um, I think it's good to reframe the way you look at success and failure and, um, you know, kind of think of nothing as a failure because you can get something positive out of even the things that we perceive as failure by our own standards. Yeah, so. one thing I like when Kron was going through his applications last year and I learned he was only going for highly selective schools. And as a, for a context, Stanford's most recent published uh, data for transfer applications and acceptances is receiving 2,000, I think it's 23 applications and only taking 20, so 1%. So it is, always have that backup plan. So when he didn't have a backup plan last year, I was like, oh dear. And I love <laughs> his reaction, which was, he kind of shrugged and said, that's okay, I have plenty. I can still do at Prairie State. And so if I don't get in, and I think you did a good job of that. Yes, so. my, my safety school was Prairie <laughs> it was State. Prairie State. So. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to point out too, USC had a unique, unique way of accepting you. I think that, um, yeah. their acceptance. Yeah, USC actually accepted me for the spring, so they have, um, that's just something they do where they will accept more transfers, but some of the transfers will um, be admitted for the spring semester as opposed to going straight in in the fall. Um, but yeah, I mean, that would still be a good option. Like had, had that been my only acceptance, I would have still been over the moon, so yeah. Yeah, so. If the, I, I know we, we invited um, both Prairie State students and local high schools, so if there are any local high school students in the room, if you want to go to a highly selective school, typically the best chance is to try to do it straight out of high school. But if that doesn't work, um, come here and try again. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Don't want to mislead anything. Okay. So... Karan made a very different switch to his approach to school um, right around spring, summer, fall, like right around 2018. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, and this is about you, you should be talking, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so before this academic year, I was um, doing no extracurriculars. I was just working full time, uh, like 50 hours a week, and then just going to school full time also. Um, and that was like the context in which I was applying to the schools last year. Uh, but then over the summer, after taking summer school, I kind of, actually I went on a meditation retreat and uh, I had time to reflect and it kind of changed my perspective. So I decided to um, focus on school full time. Uh, I had saved up a lot, so I had that luxury. I know not everybody can do that, but if you can find a way to pay for 
um, pay for school without having to work and study at the same time, I would highly recommend it because um, I feel like all the extra extracurriculars I did were a huge factor in my acceptance and a huge change from my application from year one to year two. Um, so yeah, I, I think that was absolutely crucial. Um, I switched to focusing 100% saying I'm fully committed to being at this school and getting everything out of it, as much out of it as I can. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and Karan also has a couple unique things that he did write about in his essays. So I, cause school is, they want to know about you as a person more than just school. So the extracurriculars, absolutely. We also included a couple things that you, you, um, you did include. Yeah. Um, do you want to kind of give them a context for those top couple? Yeah, top yeah. Points? So other you things. You got one of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So other things I did, uh, as it says, I was a social worker. So it's not like I was working a typical job. I was working with foster children, and um, that was a factor in my application. I also became a yoga instructor, a certified yoga instructor. So I went through the six months teacher training. Um, that was pretty intense. Uh, I also was a professional musician for years. So I took time out of school after high school. I didn't go straight to college. Um, and I pretty much just did things that excited me about life. Like I wanted to wake up in the morning and be doing something that I felt enthusiastic about doing. Um, I wasn't really ever thinking uh, during that time like, oh, I'm going to go back to school and then apply to highly selective schools, like that was never on my mind at all. Um, I didn't even think of myself as a good student. I had a 2.7 GPA in high school. Um, I lived life a little bit, um, explored, traveled. Uh, I went to a music school in Sweden um, and got funded for that. So I was able to do a lot with my life that uh, I feel like we're highly unique to my application when they were reading. Um, but it wasn't like strategic. It was just things that I felt were authentic to myself. Um, and yeah, that covers most of the things on the slide, I think. Yeah, and the, the getting, when he said getting funded, so the Swedish Institute was yeah. funded as well. Yeah. So this is something that he made a switch in the last year to being more strategic about school, but he had already been building skills of um, going out and, and doing those challenging applications and seeking out opportunities where he didn't have to be paying for everything, where there would be funding for it. Because that's a big thing. Like I, That's something I talked to him. I'm like, if, if, if I were sitting in the audience and listening to all this, I would find it pretty overwhelming. So we're really trying to break it down and make it as approachable as possible. And, there are some opportunities that when you get them, they also pay for you to be able to do that. So that is a strategy I encourage. I'm, I'm all about making life in school as affordable as possible. Yeah. Um, so Kron and I, so you made a switch into your, like you said, into getting involved on campus, um, kind of into the fall, yeah, mm -hmm. this fall. So normally you can't switch that late and make it all work out. So he had, he'd been building on his previous application cycle his having taken a gap from school, but engaging in these very meaningful activities that were just kind of building towards that. Um, so I would, you know, if I would recommend, you know, the sooner you start it, but at least expect a two year process of being deeply involved in the things that are, you are passionate for. These are, we're, we're kind of putting out there, here's what he did. Here's how Prairie State made these things possible for him by him putting in the time, the commitment and working for it. Um, there are other opportunities for other majors as well. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so research and presentations. Yeah. So, um, one thing that started last academic year in like the spring, uh, winter and spring was I did research with professor Kifowit, which is, uh, it was a great opportunity to, um, do something that isn't typical to community colleges, but it, it got me experience, it got me some, something to put on my application, um, but it was also just interesting to me. I would have conversations with a lot of professors 
um, after class and just talk about things that were interesting to me. And um, that research kind of stemmed out of that. And then we entered the uh, Skyway competition, which is just like a STEM poster competition. Um, and then that poster that we used for that and that research ended up being the research that I presented at multiple um, places this year. Um, but I think the research was also crucial because um, Stanford specifically is a very research heavy institution. So they like to see that somebody has research experience. Um, but like Sarah said, you don't have to necessarily be in STEM, although there are a lot of research opportunities for STEM students. I was also interested in like philosophy. That was my kind of two interests. I, I liked um, math and philosophy. So um, there, there's other opportunities. Oh yes, question? What was, what was your major? What was your interest when you decided to do all this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> should have mentioned that. So yeah, my major has been um, math. I started off as computer science and then I switched to math because I, um, I figured out that I liked computer science because I like math. Um, so yeah, I just figured why not kind of go straight for the thing that I actually love. But I also was double majoring in um, philosophy as well. Um, yeah, that was something that I was actually inspired by uh, Professor Streeter. Um, he, I took his class and uh, it made me realize how much I <laughs> just love learning about philosophy. And so, yeah, I did a lot of independent readings and um, yeah, basically I just, I wasn't strategic in my major at all. Like I just did what I loved. So. Yeah, and so Professor Streeter join, is joining us today, and mm -hmm. he said I, I, I encouraged him to chime in with anything, you know, because it can be scary how to connect with a professor, and um, because Professor Keepwit and Professor Streeter are definitely the professors I would keep hearing from Quran that have been an important part of the path for him. So, mm -hmm. if you have anything to add, <laughs> yeah. Well, just to what you said, Quran would visit my office with ideas of his own for what he wanted to read. And that was great. I have a lot of students come to the office to talk about the class. Um, but sometimes it's nice as a professor not to be the one like con contributing the big idea. Like I, It's really nice to have a student come into your class, who, uh, in your office, I mean, <clears throat> who has an idea of his own, wants, just wants to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And has a book that he been, has been thinking about reading on his own. And so that was great for me. Just being able to connect at that level. It wasn't um, always class related. He just wanted to talk about things that he was thinking about. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a question? Yeah, so when you started uh, doing your research, how did you go about starting that? Like, what, what was that process like? So I, I basically just had built up a relationship with uh, Professor Kifowit, um just talking about things and I just brought up in conversation because I knew I wanted to do research. I didn't have any idea of what research I would do or like what research even entailed really. I just said, do you have any ideas for research? And luckily he specifically had a lot of ideas that he had been thinking about. And he also um, routinely uh, competes in the STEM poster competition for which you have to do research. So. Um, I kind of just joined in on that research that he had already kind of got the idea for um, and just said, what can I do to help? And we kind of teamed up. I also worked with two other students. Um, so yeah, it was like a team effort. So yeah, it's, it seems overwhelming, but it's really not. Like it, if you're looking for something and you talk to professors and ask about ideas or say, I want to do research, I want to learn more about this um, academic area, they, like Professor Streeter said, they love that. So. Yeah. And if sometimes they don't have something that's a fit, but they usually tell you someone else you can check with, and mm -hmm. that follow up, like um, what Professor Streeter said, like Kron, Kron really approached this being open. He didn't, I don't think you came in with a preconceived notion of how things should be, where no. you, you were like, <laughs> this is something I'm interested in doing. 
seeking out guidance, absolutely taking that guidance, researching, reading books, checking things on, um, on the web, and that's part of takeaway points we'll come back to, but. Um, and then following up, you usually, when he and I would have chats on the, on the transfer area, he'd usually follow up 24 to 48 hours later with the, hey, I, I found this thing, and I'm curious that that was following up on something we talked about, and I found this next level of concept, and what do you think? And, you know, it's just, he kind of kept it moving mm. um, and made it his own. Because at a certain point, we're just talking about opinions and there's not going to be guarantees. Now, a lot of his stuff is going to be very math focused because that is, is Kron's interest. Um, George, or Professor Streeter and I, have, he's, he's looked into philo philosophical essay contests or competitions if you have interest there. Um, our history professor, Pariso, is aware of opportunities to seek out um, like paid internships to do archaeological type of things. Um, and not only that, but you can reach out to your other professors as well. Um, in chemistry, Professor Shabbat, I know, has done research mm. with um, a, another student who recently graduated. We have two or three biology professors that do research with students, and that's just a sampling. We have physics professors that do as well. So if you have an interest, and then our English professors, if you're interested in that world, there's, um, there's contests and competitions. Mm -hmm. And that's a point we want to make, because I think it's really super important. I don't think this would have happened if Quran, a couple key things that were especially vital is having done the research, entered and successfully got in and presented at both at national, getting to the national level, I think really made a difference. Regional is your way to kind of work up there. Mm -hmm. So Skyway was regional and then the Atlanta and the DC ones were national things. Um, mm. And then the other pieces, being a really good writer, which we'll touch on later. How did you make it possible to go to Atlanta and go to DC? Um, so that was actually an idea that um, happened because of uh, Professor, um, uh, well actually it was, I, I knew that I wanted to present the research somewhere, but um, Professor Spencer was the one who kind of told me about all these opportunities where I could present um, in competitions. So she, like, when you talk to her, she'll just, you'll just say one thing and then she'll spew out a bunch of resources to help you. Um, and she's great for that type of thing. So it really, I can't take a lot of credit for finding that. She just told me, okay, you should sign up for this, you should, you know, um, apply to all of these different conferences. There were, there were at least like three other ones that I applied to that I got in, but I didn't, I couldn't um, go to because I would have missed like half the semester. Um, but yeah, I went to those ones and presented there. Um, but like I said, if you just talk, build a relationship with professors, they are more than happy to help you with a lot of resources. They'll tell you everything they know because they are on your team. And I think that's something that's, you know, really special about community colleges is like you get to develop that relationship and, you know, they have the same goals. This is just related to what you're saying, but um, maybe obvious, but what I observed in you though, was also the commitment to developing relationships with your peers, other students yeah. in the classroom, mm -hmm. outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, I think, something that sometimes students forget. Like, they think, oh, I just have to show up to class and, 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 and develop a relationship with the professor, yeah. and then I leave. But the more you integrate yourself into the classroom, outside the classroom, with your fellow students, I think the more you can accomplish here yeah. the things that you're talking about, developing those interests, developing those passions. That's true. Um, and I saw that in you, just like the way you were sharing your ideas, not just with your professors, mm -hmm. but with other students. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. And that's huge, I think, because you need a way to articulate your ideas to lots of different kind of people. Yeah. In order to write the kind of letter that you wrote, you need to, you need to be able to have conversations with lots of different kind of people. Yeah. Um, about your ideas and about your passions, you know, which... Uh, yeah, I agree. That's a good point. Um, because... Yeah, I'm gonna... Jump heavy. There's oh, yeah. actually some groups he was part of while he yeah. was on campus here. In addition to the groups you had and yeah, that you just knew from your classes, I'm sure. Yeah. So that, like, 
like I, like Professor Streeter said, I like to talk about philosophy with not only professors but with other students too. And um, you know, I tried to I tried to get a philosophy club started actually, or I, we tried to kind of get it back up and running, but um, we couldn't necessarily pin down an idea that would be attractive to as enough students to make a sustainable club. But then I also, you know, would talk about meditation and uh, I developed a family and the speech team and um, I would just try to make myself as social as possible, not for the sake of any um, end goal, but just to kind of get the most out of life, get the most out of my time here as possible. It wasn't like I was looking at the end goal and saying, okay, I'm going to take every single step so then, then I, I can get the end goal and then be happy. I wanted to be happy at every single moment along the way, along the path. And um, that way I win regardless of what happened at the end. Um, and yeah, communicating with, all, developing relationships with everybody around me was part of that because there's so much to learn from every single person that you interact with, regardless of their title or um, position. So. Yeah, so this first one, that was just an informal thing that developed because of connecting the, with which you guys touched on, the uh, Professor Streeter, and you kind of developed your knowledge. Um, Mm -hmm. Phi Theta Kappa, if you have at least 12 credit college credits at Prairie State and a 3.5 GPA or higher, you should join this. It is a nationally, it's a national honor society that is recognized um, throughout the country. It's an honor, you, it's only for people who have gone to a community college. More than 600 colleges and universities have special PTK, Phi Theta Kappa scholarships for community college students transferring to them. They vary from $1,000 to um, one of the bigger ones I've seen was about half tuition. So uh, there are universities though that get lists of the members so they can send you guys emails and things like that. Um, that's, and so Phi Theta Kappa, he, not, he, he joined it. You were treasurer and you were the rep to our Student Government <laughs> Association for them. Mm -hmm. Speech team is, is a unique thing, an audition uh, thing that you did. STEM club, if you're interested in any science or math, information, there's tons of other clubs, so all, all different interests that they exist at Prairie State tutoring. Um, these are a couple things that were not Prairie State things, but we couldn't, the very bottom, the activities, we couldn't figure out how to name a slide and just have those two points on it. So mm -hmm. do you want to talk about the, those role, how those were helpful to you? Yeah, so those were things that I did over the summer. Um, just, again, just things that I was interested in. Um, you know, some, some people probably would have advised me not to do, especially the meditation retreat, because it's like, I think in some circles, it's seen as like a waste of time. You're just sitting there doing nothing. How can it be beneficial? Um, but it was something that I felt connected to. So I did it despite the advice not to. Um, and the Infinity and Paradox course was actually a resource that I found just searching online. Um, so a lot of institutions will um, kind of post their classes online and you can participate in like the online class uh, as though you were a student, but you just, you know, do, um, you don't actually have to show up there. You don't actually have to pay a fee. It's just free resources that you get to learn about things that are interesting. And that class specifically was actually a hybrid class of math and philosophy. So it was like, I saw it, I was like, I can't pass this up. Like this is exactly the class that I dreamed of, yeah. so. And one thing you mentioned to me, you thought it, uh, I remember you saying you thought it was useful. It kept you in the school mindset over the summer. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it, I didn't actually have any break. This is, so I haven't, this kind of last two weeks has been my first break since, what, 2017. Um, <laughs> Because over summer, I took summer school, and then right after summer school started, in the little two-week gap, I did the Paradox and Infinity course. So it was like another class. Um, I basically was just using my time uh, wisely, I guess, uh, except for, according to some people, the meditation retreat. But. <laughs> 
You didn't have to pay for the class, you just audited? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can actually pay if you want an official certificate. Um, I think it's like $50. Um, but yeah, the MIT has a lot of classes, Berkeley, um, Harvard, Columbia, like a lot of the um, name brand schools have, um, have a lot of courses on edX and Udemy. Um, you, you can just search online open source classes and a lot of them will come up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're called MOOCs, M-O-O-C, and I don't remember what that stands for. <laughs> yeah, Massive Open Online Course there you go. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, other, you know, uh, things to um, accomplishments. I guess you racked up. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. Um, uh, so the the PTK thing was that's another perk of joining Phi Theta Kappa. Um, there's like one application that you do, and you can apply to uh, like five different scholarships at the same time. Unfortunately, I didn't end up winning the All USA academic team, but I won All Illinois. Um, and um, Mary Ann, uh, the other All Illinois representative, she actually won the uh, Bronze Scholar for the Coca-Cola Scholarship. So, and that was just, it was an easy application that I did in like one day. So I recommend anybody that can do that to apply. That's on in the tra the scholarships handout I have in the back. It's on the the back side of that. So, if you're a PTK member, ptk.org, they actually have this common application that, um, as you fill it out, it lets you know which ones. There's actually multiple scholarships, and if you're you know as you're filling it out, it determines what you're eligible for, and you can continue to actually. Um, this was for a distinguishment, but then you get advanced on the they get two students, they designate two students per community college per year, and you're advanced on for further review, and Marianne, the other student that won it this year, got um, something that came with a scholarship. This was, a dis you know, it's a wonderful recognition. Yeah. I don't think this one came with a scholarship, though. Right? Yeah. But um, an awesome thing. So Jack Kent Cook is another unique thing. The undergraduate transfer scholarship is a uh, is specific to community college graduates. You cannot have attended a four-year university and, be, and still be eligible for this. It is highly competitive. Um, you have to apply, get everything done in October to use it the next August, and you're, generally they want you ready, you know, graduating and ready to be a junior that next August. Um, if a student gets it, it's $40,000 a year renewable for up to three years. In 2013, Prairie State had two students get that scholarship. Um, Karan applied, and he got semifinalist, which was about 120 students um, were recognized. At, in past years, they've had over 1,500 applications. And um, he didn't get the final final, but that worked out OK for him. Um, yeah. 60 students ended up getting that. But it's, a, it's, it's part of the process, though, where he just kept getting more uh, used to and understanding very complicated applications. These are not easy ones, but to get the big money, you have to go for the more complicated things. And then I would, I'd like to think that doing that in Phi Theta Kappa, because those are both read, like October and December for the next August, kept you in the scholarship mindset and just yeah. the application mindset too. Yeah, it was, um, it was a really helpful experience doing all of those applications because I ended up using some of the skeletons of those essays that I used for the scholarships for my application for colleges. So I didn't have to restart all of the essays. And one thing specifically for transfers is like the essays are a really important part of your application because that's how you become a human being as opposed to a list of accomplishments. Mm -hmm. uh, these schools, like a lot of people have a lot of good stats and accolades and to kind of make yourself stand out, you have to have good essays. Um, and then another thing about the uh, Jack Kent Cook specifically is being a semi-finalist actually got me on a list of, um, of students that got uh, emails from certain colleges where I got a free application to those colleges. So I didn't have to pay the application fee for uh, Williams or uh, Swarthmore, which are two uh, liberal arts colleges. And I didn't end up getting rejected from either one of those, so uh, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> yeah. 
so yeah, it was it was productive even though I didn't actually win the scholarship. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it seems like as you know, pursuing these things, even if they don't work out for that immediate goal, it seems to open other doors and other opportunities. It builds our skills. Uh, for example, one of your web courses was that related to you be doing the NASA Scholar? Yeah. Or, do you want to talk was, about that? Yeah, that was something separate. And I, tell them what that is too. <laughs> yeah. So the NASA Community College Aerospace Scholars, um, it's something that you have to apply for. It starts off as an online course. Um, you have to get a letter of recommendation, and um, once you get into that, you take an online course for about, I think it was half of the semester, so it was like eight weeks, and um, I was basically just learning about um, interplanetary travel and the different technologies that NASA uses. Um, yeah, it was like an engineering course, kind of, and I was doing that at the same time as, um, as classes, that semester and speech team so it was like kind of hard to manage but um, if you do well enough in the online course you actually get to do an on-site experience at a NASA facility which was really cool so I'm gonna be doing that this summer um, but yeah it it's it's definitely manageable like it's it's tough you have to kind of um, pick and choose what to spend your time on but I would recommend everybody apply to that, even if you're not interested in STEM specifically, because there's, uh, they look for all majors. Like you don't have to be an engineering major or even in the STEM fields. Um, and that's something that applies to all research or any of these opportunities that I talk about. Um, it doesn't matter if you don't see yourself as the typical applicant to some of these things. Um, you just, kind of try to step outside your comfort zone because I, you know, like I said, I didn't see myself as a speech person. I hated public speaking, but it ended up giving me so much benefit. And yeah, I would recommend that for everybody. Yeah, and, and being connected to, I understand Dr. Spencer, who, Dr. Spencer is one of our math professors, but she mentors students of all majors and you, probably haven't had a class with her, have you? Did, no, did you? no, I never had a class She doesn't care if you were her student or not. If she knows you have aspirations, she wants to talk to you about um, how to support that. She and I keep each other's business cards in our offices because there's, they, you know, if they have the chat with me, then, and I think they're fit for the sort of things that she guides students on, I give them her card to follow up as well. Um, and she told you about the LSAMP, um, that's um, a program that is paid. You yes. get paid to go to, and you just recently learned about it. It was kind of one of those last minute doors that open. Yeah. And you have to decline to other opportunities to make that happen, but yeah. like it's supporting your future research goals, um, right? Yeah, so that was, that was something that, um, basic, another thing that I started doing this year was just saying yes to everything. Uh, sometimes it got me into trouble, like for instance that I had already committed to the speech camp, which uh, <laughs> I can't do now, but um, yeah, I, that was something she just walked in. She was like, do you want to do this? I was like, okay, uh, when do I have to finish my application? She was like, uh, try to get it in today. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I did that and ended up getting accepted the same day, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah. <laughs> All right. So we keep talking about applications. These are some of the applications that he dealt with. Common application, there's over 800 colleges and universities that um, use this one, where you, so you don't have to fill out 14 different applications. You can fill one out and then answer whatever essays each specific school requires. There's some reports that are required as part of common application. That's one thing I'm super grateful for. Common application requires a uh, some schools require a college report to be filled out, and I'm your contact on campus if you're a Prairie State student doing a common application and needing that report. And that last year is what got us talking about. I, Karan used to be just someone I said hi to in the hall, like you yeah. know. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, you have this whole other level of interest that like let's let, let's talk about what you can do to um, enable it. Yeah. So common application. Yeah, um, this is just kind of for a context, and then we just have some tips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Start early. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Um, that's really important. Like I said, getting rejected last year was a blessing in disguise because I had 
a base of like six different schools essays that I could use and then if I didn't apply there last year I could just use the same essays even for some of the applications or I could kind of um, figure out what I did wrong in these applications so I kind of looked at my whole um, failure as like an opportunity to see where I can improve and kind of objectively look at my profile um, but yeah, so I started early. This whole process was like a two-year process in that way, um, especially the essays. So even though I technically did most of the meat of the essays at the very last minute, uh, actually, Professor Trennell and uh, Professor uh, Sam <laughs> <laughs> helped me um, look over my essays literally an hour before they were due, but <laughs> there was still a process that was in the works for a long time. <laughs> so yeah. That was uh, 11 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was 11 p.m. But he <laughs> was working, he was using, it was almost like the first years were his drafts that he then honed and revised or created new things when appropriate. Exactly. So. Um, letters of reference, good, good tip is give them at least a month's notice ahead of time and let them know if you're, if you're planning to apply to multiple schools. They're usually fine with that because they can just adapt what they do for one school. But you know, give them a heads up of what you know and then you modify it you know, as, as things go on. Um, if you're applying to a highly selective school, they typically do require your ACT or SAT. So for some students, that means retaking it. So yeah. just a heads up about that. If you are not applying to a highly selective school and you're transferring from a community college, they usually do not care at all what your ACT was. They just look at your college work. So your the ACT and SA, or SAT? Yeah, that was another thing that I had to do. Like I, I retook the, the ACT um, because although I had um, you know, an okay score, I looked at all of the scores that were typical to students that go to these schools and I tried to shoot for like the 50th percentile. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to kind of up my score to get in that range. Um, and yeah, it ended up being a good decision, I think. But I also don't think if you don't want to do this, like I don't think it's a very crucial part, especially if you've been out of school as long as I have, or just if you have good grades in college, that's much more important than your SAT or ACT score but these schools do typically ask for them um, just to have some reference mm -hmm. yeah okay so we're starting to hit so our takeaway points we put them all into that one handout which is in the back i think i saw a lot of you grab that we touched on a lot of these things throughout this so like our focus we're really the focus of this workshop is to break down the activities the methods the perspectives that cron put in place that were really successful for him here so other people can re find what's right for you and recreate it for you. Um, but we don't, we don't think this is a list of, okay, I'm gonna check off the list and do all these things <laughs> that he did. So find your own interest, which you said that was your path mm -hmm. through your whole thing. And you know, like a little piece I think of is like, I, like I went to Northwestern for graduate school. I went to a public university for undergrad, um, which was my top choice. That's where I wanted to go to and a public in-state university, and I loved it, and I got an equally good education. I am gonna say, it, absolutely. I didn't know I wanted to go to grad school at any point in my undergrad. I was not <laughs> systematically or strategically doing anything that lots of the Cron and lots of our students are doing here. We have exceptional students that are well beyond what I, what I was in undergrad. I followed my interest. I went to work, I continued to follow my interests, and that was good enough. I mean, I was a good student and it, it got me into things too, but you can be a lot more strategic than I was. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I can also say, you know, at, when I was a graduate student at Northwestern, I was a TA for a semester and graded undergraduate Northwestern essays, you know, students of people that were juniors at Northwestern and Kron's writing and writing of other students that we have here are right at par, better than my writing, um, and right at par or above students I saw there. Um, connect with your professors, I think we mentioned that a lot. <laughs> Super important, you got the people mentoring. Um, as soon as I have someone tell me that they want to go for something that it might be more of a reach or it's going to be more competitive, I'm like, talk to your teachers engage in activities, do the clubs, things like that. It's so that it can all grow and build into, you know, these kind of outcomes. 
you looked like you were gonna say something too. Yeah, no, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, you and um, Professor Streeter were among the first people that like I told about this goal, because um, it kind of just like hit me. Uh, well, actually, no, it was my mom's idea. She was like, you should apply here, <laughs> of course. Uh, but when I told you guys that was something that I was thinking about attempting to do, you didn't write me off or make me feel like it was an impossible goal. Um, you guys supported me and said, okay, let's make it happen. Um, and I think had I not had that vote of confidence, especially coming from where I come from, having my high school story, like I said, I wasn't a good student in high school. I didn't ever think of myself as a good student or even particularly smart or talented at anything. But um, you guys made me feel like that was not the right way to look at myself. And that was essential to my journey. So cool. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I also want to, that's something he and I, so we chatted about um, where you, do, you did recall, so like anyone in this room or we're going to post the video, so people watching the video later, um, come talk to me. If you're, you're a student here or thinking about coming, becoming a student here, come talk to me and we'll have similar chats and I'll do the same thing I did to Karan too, which is, I, what, you, there was some, you know, where I think I talked about having that backup plan, you know. Mm -hmm. I always want to have multiple plans because we are going to stress ourselves out or things don't always work out the way that we want to in life. And yeah, yeah I think, you, I think I, you told me, I, I told a story about someone who didn't have a backup plan and how stressful that was for them. And I don't want, I don't want anyone in that kind of situation, you know. Yeah. Uh, so if I have that conversation with you, I had it with him too, okay? <laughs> so it's not, it is part of the accepting and supporting. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I think one thing particular to my own perspective of this was that um, I wouldn't have seen it as a failure even if I got rejected everywhere because I know what it feels like to not um, be typically successful. And so I question um, wh where we even get our ideas of success. Um, so it wasn't like I was looking at like I said, I wasn't looking at this end goal as something that was going to be defining my fulfillment in life. Um, if you think like, oh, all my problems are going to be solved once I get into this school, once I get to this point, I'm going to be happy then. Like, that, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Um, so yeah, I would say have a backup plan and realize that even if you, know, you don't get into your, a, your plan A school, maybe it happened for a reason and whatever ends up happening was the plan A all along. And that's kind of how I looked at everything that happened, even like yeah. I mentioned multiple times, getting rejected everywhere last yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you were kind of touching on the, the point that take time for yourself or having mm -hmm. that meaningful focus. So I just kind of went over to that slide. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. So there, like I said, there was a lot of things that I just did for myself. Um, but also I kind of took the perspective of trying to do things for others, um, not for the sake of putting on my application or anything. I was just, you know, volunteering and trying to get the most out of life as, as I could. Um, I think we kind of touched on yeah. the others. Um, so this, uh, this is a point prioritizing school when Colleges, competitive colleges are choosing between you and someone else. If you're taking a full-time load and you're handling all these outside, you're handling outside activities and you're excelling at those things, that's how, and you're a great writer, you, that's how you rise above everyone else. So I thought you were part-time last year in school was, mm, or no. you had had some part-time, like your previous yeah. enrollment kind of showed stopping in and out of school. And, yeah, so I actually started in 2015 and I was like yeah. taking one class a semester. Yeah, so, at, so when they would be reviewing his applications last year, looking at the data, didn't, you didn't see a person that was prioritizing school. And the essays could say that, but they don't know it. Like, so he went all in and he showed that. Like, and that is part of the picture, I think. So being full-time. But do not overload yourself. Do not sacrifice your performance, or otherwise that's going to not help the goal. Um, 
he did a huge amount of things, but some of them were very small things. He did the research and then the later presentations were just things that built on it. It wasn't a huge time commitment. So mm -hmm. one thing, we don't want you to overwhelm yourself. Find them things that are meaningful for yourself, two or more. Um, it doesn't have to be a huge list. What you might find is they just grow into these other opportunities that become something on your list that you presented here as part of your group and as, as part of your work in whatever group. Um, yeah, and research, do, yeah, I, we talked about, we talked about that. Um, writing, Kron is, a, he is very good at writing. His essays are not the typical essays. He's pretty creative in how he approached things. Yeah. And do you want to talk about, or maybe we should just say it real quick, I'm like, we're almost hitting at time, yeah. um, how you went about deciding to do your essays? Um, yeah, so... And research them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I would read essays online that had previously got accepted to these schools. Um, there's a lot of people that post on like forums and um, different sites like Reddit, uh, which I don't recommend getting all your information from by any means, but uh, there can be some useful things. Um, so I'd, I also bought a book of past essays that had been accepted, and I saw like the trend that a lot of these were creative. They weren't just the typical, why do you want to go to our school? I want to go to your school because like they were all telling stories or entertaining to read. And so that's the approach I try to take with my writing all of the essays. Also, it just felt more fun to do myself. So if it's fun to write, it's probably more fun to read. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I think that helped this year was doing speech team. Um, because it helped me kind of readjust my communication style. Um, and I also entered like writing, the writing contest. And uh, I think my songwriting background also helped with my creative writing approach. But I would say like if you're trying to do the same thing, 100% make your essays uh, more creative as opposed to um, as opposed to, uh, you know, typical. And another thing uh, was the philosophy classes kind of helped me. I would write essays for that, and uh, Professor Streeter would rip my essay to shreds, and then I would uh, kind of know, but he would be very good at telling you exactly what was missing with your um, thought process and explaining how you can communicate your ideas better. So. I think all of those things in combination helped me with the writing. And like I said, the essays were the most important part of the application. So um, if there's one thing to do, it's read as much as possible and practice writing. Um, and you're, don't assume that your essays are going to be great right off the bat. I wrote multiple drafts. <laughs> so obviously, you take composition classes here. but the philosophy classes and humanities can really expand critical thinking and those skills as well. And also your teachers are trying to help you be better. Like I have a very fragile ego of my writing. It always is very hard for me to read um, people edits when I was at school it, to, and work to get beyond that if you have that, that trait as like myself. Um, Quran doesn't, doesn't have that issue. He can read that and go, oh, this is how it can be better. Like, and he really benefited from that. So philosophy and humanities courses. We have creative writing courses. I mean, a lot of your professors and many of your topics are going to require writing and really take it to the most and, and really um, get the most out of the feedback that they're giving you. So we talked about planning early, researching your universities, um, visiting. So he actually visited Stanford and he talked about that in his essays, citing specific professors and halls and clubs he planned to join like it was a read very genuine like because mm -hmm. it, it can also just sound like you're just kind of you know just making up something so you know you want to be genuine about it and I but I think that that really made a difference we can't always go to every university that we want to visit in person every university you can learn a lot online. yes so mm -hmm. online info so their website of course but a lot of times they'll have online information sessions or sometimes Chicago is we're so lucky that they will come here to do uh, sessions 
Um, this one's not a university, but the Jack Kent Cook Foundation did an info session at University of Chicago that Cron went to. And, yeah, um, and yeah, I, I learned a lot about yeah. that information, and I got a free uh, U Chicago shirt. So, <laughs> <was a> little, <laughs> so it's like all this knowledge, the things you learned for that, probably helped later for your applications. Yes, being it, at that info session, too. It, it definitely did. There is. Um, there was a girl there also, uh, I focused a lot on the writing portion. So there was a girl there that won the Jack Kent Cook um, uh, scholarship the year before, and she read her essays that she used that won that. And again, she had a creative approach. Also, she talked about the different extracurricular things that she did and um, ways that she showed that she had leadership. And one thing that she did was she uh, used a 3D printer that somebody in her community had and used it to print out um, limbs for amputees. Um, she kind of initiated that herself, but of course she had guidance just like I have in every single step along the way. But she was probably like me in that she asked questions and said, how can I make a difference in the community? How can I help people with my presence? And that was the foundation that she um, started with when applying to that scholarship and it worked out for her. Um, so yeah, j just thinking about things like that, like I think there's a bunch of creative ways that we all can learn to kind of um, benefit the people around us um, just by using the resources that we don't necessarily always know are there and by asking questions, building relationships and um, starting with that um, drive to want to help people so yeah yeah so I think we're kind of hitting an end point did you have any other major points you wanted to put in or uh, not that I can remember but <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. if anybody has any questions um, or anything that I failed to touch on I have a question. Mm -hmm. so you said you weren't like the best um, high school student mm -hmm. so then what made you even like start at Period. I don't know if you said that. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of something that was always in the back of my mind. Like I always wanted to go back to school. I um, made the promise to my mom that, okay, I'll take time off school, I'll work, but I will end up going back to school eventually. Like, just trust <laughs> me. Um, and one thing, one thing that was actually interesting in the uh, meditation retreat that I went on was I told somebody that same story. I was like, oh, I made the promise to my mom that I'd go back to school. And he asked me a question that threw me off. He just said, why? And I was kind of like under the um, mindset that had been given to us by society that, yeah, of course, everybody has to go to school. Like, this is the only option. This is the only way to be successful. But him just simply asking why I would make that promise to my mom made me think, is this really what I want to do? Or is it something that she would want me to do or that society wants me to do? And when I really genuinely asked myself that, I realized it is something that I want to do, genuinely. Um, I would catch myself outside of school, I would be reading, I would try, and try to learn as much as possible. Um, and that was just something that I enjoyed doing. So I knew that I had to go back to the academic setting because I was you know, looking at lectures online anyway. So why not <laughs> get proof? I think part of that question is what caused you to choose Prairie State? Was that part of the question? What, like why he chose Prairie State too? That, right, was that right. part of it also? Like, yeah. You, yeah. Why, so why'd you walk in our well, door? Well, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. 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 Like, so when you started, were you like undeclared a major, or did you not have a major? Or you were just taking. Yeah. Class? Yeah, I was. I was undeclared. Like I said, I was taking one, one or two classes a semester, and then I took time off after that first two semesters. Um, I chose Prairie State because it was close to home and I could work and go to school at the same time and just kind of explore, kind of get my uh, feet wet and get back into the um, routine of going to school because I had been out for so long I didn't even remember simple areas of math so of course I couldn't um, <laughs> declare myself a math major, uh, at least not from the get-go. Um, but yeah, Prairie State was the most affordable, it was also the most convenient, and 
Um, I later learned about all the resources that are available for students here. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Why? Well, oh, yeah. So how did you find essays of other students? That seems so weird that you can find other people's essays. Yeah, I would, um, I mean, you can just Google, like, Stanford accepted essays, and yeah, they'll come up. Um, like I said, I used Reddit because they have like forums specifically for all every school that you could think of. Um, so people will post the essays that got them into the school just to help out other um, students. There's also sites like College Confidential, which again, the, I, I want to make the disclaimer not to take everything you see on those <laughs> sites, um, you know, as absolute, but some people do post their essays and it was very helpful. And there's also, if you go, um, I think I found at, in the campus library, I found a bunch of books that were about writing, about the college application process. And there were some books that were just compilations of essays that had been accepted um, to highly select, selective schools. So all of those were different resources. Yep, so our, library, our librarians can help you uh, find that on campus. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, well, I want to thank you, Kron, for sharing your story so that other people can benefit from it, too. I really appreciate it. I was like, well, I kept asking, thank you. is it okay? We're going to tell them all about you. <laughs> is this okay? So. One, one thing I also want to say is, like, um, you know, this isn't, like I said, I, I don't think I'm particularly special or, like, talented to the extent that other people can't do the exact same thing. Like, I think I was just a product of all of the people that helped me and just being open to taking advice and um, allowing myself to be molded into what I am now as opposed to just continuing on the path I, I was going down in high school. Um, I had a lot of uh, adversity that I had to overcome, but it ended up being essential to me being here now. And I wouldn't have been able to do this without all of that, all of the adversity, all of the people that helped lift me up out of that adversity. So it's not like, I don't look at it as something that I did, you know, it's something that we did as a community. So, yeah. Thanks. So I have my contact information up here. I, it, my contact information's on the bottom of most of the handouts. Some are general handouts for the college, so they're not on everything the college gives out, but. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. There's cookies and water. And if you want me to email you this PowerPoint, um, be sure to note your email on the sign-in sheet. So, thanks. Thank you.